a uh, very good afternoon to one and all and uh, on behalf of the national academy of sciences india delhi chapter and the india upadhyay college university of delhi i would like to welcome our eminent speaker for today dr saranayan vijay raghavan who is a senior scientist at central electrochemical research institute karaikudi and he'll be talking to us on a very interesting topic which will be definitely beneficial to all uh, students uh, science students as well as teachers that is ethics in science education and practice and this whole program is part of uh, the school outreach program which is a nearly 3 months program which we have planned for starting from september and it will culminate somewhere in december and before inviting Dr. Vijay Raghavan, so just to briefly introduce him to the attendees. Well, he did his B.Sc. from Loyola College Chennai and M.Sc. from Delft University of Technology, New Zealand, and M.Sc. in Nanotechnology from Charles University of Technology, Sweden. He has served as a research scientist at University of Basel, Switzerland. and he did his phd in molecular nanoscience from technical university of munich germany and postdoc at national institute of material science japan and his current research interest is in the area of scanning tunneling microscopy spectroscopy atomic and dynamic force microscopy interfacial charge transport and corrosion monitoring with these words i invite dr vijay rakhwan to kindly share his screen Thank you, uh, Dr. Manoj. Thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, should I introduce my slide now? Yeah, please. Can you see it? Ah, uh, no. Ah, uh, you have to share it again. Yes, now it's come up. If you can put it in the slideshow. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm very happy here uh, for the invitation by Dr. Manoj. I'm happy to be a part of this lecture series. Uh, already, a few people, a few of my friends also have given a talk here. A few of my colleagues have participated here, and uh, they have had a very good experience now in the past as well. and i have but uh, in this uh, series i did not i did not know how many people actually talked on the ethics part am i the first dr manoj or no uh, you are the second one do we have earlier had also a talk on ethics and science no uh, from uh, my friend uh, in iit exactly yes yes yeah that was more about computer science and all exactly, that exactly yes yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's uh, i i here in this lecture i'll not uh, go into too much details about uh, what is the no uh, detailed theoretical description of ethics or what are the things which books are saying and these kind of things i'll try to concentrate on some of the problems which we had faced on a bigger scale on a smaller scale and what are the things that are important to do a scientific work in a most straightforward and honest way how exactly are we going to perform scientific experiments what are the things we need to look at an experiment how do we determine a scientific experiment is true or false i'll be concentrating only on these aspects from the people whom i have learned so these are just some of the practical tips which i have known during my research career okay even though i said there won't be too much theoretical description i have to actually say a little bit uh, a very brief definition of uh, ethics so most of you already might know what ethics is it is not such a very alien word however the description of what we see as ethics is different in different places ethics it's not the same as how we feel ethics is not the same as what we think about certain aspects of science ethics is also not about what we think whether it is morally right or wrong ethics is more or less 
strict and straightforward rules of how to conduct yourself in the field of science and straight and strict rules about how experiments are to be performed in a scientific environment. So, since these moral rules are strict, we can say from the beginning that a very strict discipline of moral principle is essential. So, there are only two aspects of it, which is you, the person doing the experiment, and secondly, the experiment itself. These are the two things which are very essential. We have to see if both these things are true. Whatever experiments, whatever science you do, I'm not talking about a research level. Even if you are a ninth standard or 10th standard student, these rules are very well applicable to you. Whatever you read, for example, is it trustable? We have to ask this. And can you be trusted? The second one is a very important question because if there is a kind of aberration or a confusion or a conflict in your mind, the knowledge that is going into your mind is not in a very going in a straightforward way because there is already a disturbance. If in an empty space, light goes without any hindrance, but if you put a glass of green color in between, then the, light, uh, then the light that goes to the other side is going to be green in a simplified way. Similarly, the knowledge that goes into your head, if it is very straightforward or if it is going to be colored by your fear, insecurities and doubts. This we have to first of all see. And then only we can see whether the data can be or cannot be trusted. The next point which is important is whatever scientific data we present is going to be very important. It has a far reaching potential and far reaching implications. So we have to take whatever we do, we have to consider it as very important. This, is, this can also be told in another way. You should believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, you will not have the confidence to do the right kind of experiments. If you don't believe in the right kind of experiments, and the implications of your experiment is not going to have the profound impact. If you are doing something with your heart is not at all inside this uh, work, then it is almost impossible that it is going to reach a world-class scale. When we take the case of uh, famous scientists like Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein, their work was very important because they all believed their work was very important. If they think that it is not just an important work and it is uh, we can do it in the evening or something like this, it is not going to have a far-reaching implication. So this far-reaching implication has a direct, uh, direct correlation on the psychology of the scientist. The third and most important point is how you are going to communicate these data and scientific experiments to the outer world. There are only certain mediums. These days you can make a YouTube channel or you can write in a popular magazine like Scientific American or New Scientist or anything. But the official communication for all scientific data is only through journal papers. And the journal papers will accept your data to be truthful and original only if it goes through certain ethical guidelines. And these ethical guidelines have to be the same in all countries, wherever you are working in. Only if all your data passes through an ethical filter, only then collaboration and sharing of knowledge is encouraged. If the data is questionable, if the experiment is somewhat shaky, it is not possible to have a successful collaboration. For this, again, you have to be confident about your results. For example, if you are able to do 70% of the experiment, and if you want to ask someone in the next college or university to help you with the remaining 30% of the experiment, first of all, you should be confident that you, your 70% is all right. But if there is a lot of false information in your 70% itself, then how can we go and ask someone else? So collaboration and sharing of data cannot be done if your ethical guidelines are weaker. So from the honesty and ethical point of view in doing the experiments, 
From there only, all this collaboration, sharing of knowledge, how we teach others and how in turn we learn from others are going to happen. If you are using animal experiments for people interested in doing biology, there is even more stricter guidelines because the animals should not suffer. We cannot just inject, inject some poison inside the animal's skeleton, a skeletal system or nervous system because it will suffer. And that is not the goal of science. The goal of science is just to see, uh, to record a particular reaction to a particular impulse. That is what we will be interested. So every animal or even a human being has to be treated in the right way. These are all things which doesn't have to be written in books. These are all, these are all comes from human conscience. Even if there is a vaccine for humans, for example, Corona, if we are directly testing it on a human instead of an animal, we have the right, we should actually intimate the human subject that they are going to take a drug which has not been tested and they have the right to object or withdraw anytime. It cannot be done in a forceful way in most countries, including India, because India has one of the strongest ethical rules in a scientific environment. Maybe some countries don't follow it, but the majority of the countries have very strict ethical rules to be followed if you are using live organisms and only after passing through all this, your research is validated. Lastly, every uh, the competition in science is getting very, very high. There are a lot of people having a BSc or MSc or PhD in all modes of science, in, uh, even in mathematics. And uh, if there is one person appearing for a job, there are 10 other people with even more higher qualifications applying for the same job. So in these cases, when the competition is very high, the way to filter out unwanted competition is your ethical standard. So obviously when the competition is high, the ethical standards also keep on increasing. And we should be able to cope up. We should be able to uh, stand up to the bar where each of uh, these guidelines meet. And uh, as the ethical guidelines keep on changing, you should be ready to change yourself to a higher and higher standard. Any of these basic rules, which I told uh, now, should not be violated at any cost. A violation of ethical rules will have a very deep impact on your career. In fact, you can think that the career of a scientist is usually over once there is something unethical in the profession has happened. Of course, it is not all bad, like people will continue in their job, but the credibility of your research will go down. So one has to be very careful on how honestly we do these experiments. Those, the previous ones which I talked are about ethics, which means the rules are much stricter, but there are things called moral dilemmas. For example, here are a few examples. Can we spend a lot of money on science when people have no food in India? This is a valid question. Can we do any experiments, even if it has drastic consequences for humanity? We'll see examples of this. Should we use results from a bad experiment if it helps people now? Maybe the experiment was done 100 years back and it was very bad for people. But what are we learning now? For example, Americans dropped an atom atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. And it killed a lot of Japanese people and a lot of them are still suffering from radiation damages. But we have, now we have very credible evidences of how radiation is going to affect mankind. That is a very useful scientific data. Based on that, if a person is going into an X-ray lab, we can use this data and uh, make a timetable or make a chart of how radiation is affecting the skin. But just for this, do we need to use an atom bomb in Japan? These are moral dilemmas. Should we change the genome sequences of embryos? If, for example, an unborn child or a neonatal stage, if they have a genetic defect, 
or a syndrome should we alter its genome is it is it not interfering with nature these questions have no answers another example is the making of the atomic bomb and the role of albert einstein few examples we'll see here the photo you see is uh, of a german chemist called uh, fritz haber he actually was the one first introduced the synthesis of ammonia in a very simple way he passed nitrogen and hydrogen inside iron particles and what we got was ammonia to put it as simple as that nitrogen and hydrogen could not combine in a normal way but somehow miraculously on the surface of iron particles activated iron particles they stick on top of these particles and when they come out they come out as nitrogen it's a very very simple and efficient process and you get back the iron iron is a catalyst but it is not spent you get it back and amount of money loss is very very less so it's a very very interesting phenomena but actually for this process fritz haber got the nobel prize in chemistry in 1918 18 for the synthesis of ammonia but the problem was after he developed the synthesis of ammonia a lot of his work a lot lo uh, another lo lot of uh, ways of synthesizing ammonia were developed and used for chemical warfare so in turn fritz haber was called the father of chemical weapons even before uh, even before he got the nobel prize from 1914 to 1919 during this years he spent all of his efforts only for developing poisonous gases to kill people of course now we have a technique where we can synthesize ammonia in a very cheap and large quantities but do the risks outweigh the benefits or the, do the benefits outweigh the risks we have to think there was this uh, medical doctor called joseph mengel he was a doctor in the nazi concentration camps he was overseeing all the camps like uh, auschwitz and uh, polish camps and uh, i don't remember all the names but most of these uh, uh, bogen camp dakau and all these places what he did was he did a lot of very very bad and evil experiments on the inmates there for example he took a lot of twins and he wanted to see if one of the twin is uh, they will first separate the twins if one of the twin is harmed whether this creates an emotional reaction in the other twin in the other baby and uh, what if children how uh, do children have more susceptibility do they have more flexibility do they do children have uh, more resistance to harmful chemicals one of this uh, experiments is exposing children to very harmful gases this is the picture you see here their skin usually gets very black and they die after some time what if the children are exposed to very harmful bacteria what is going to happen these are not things which you can test on the outside world so he did it on the prisoners but that is a stark violation of human rights and completely unethical because all he had was only one thing to prove that the germans were superior over time whatever he did the everybody started criticizing and he also died after the war but a lot of children a lot of twins and even a lot of adults got uh, uh uh got very very deadly diseases and they died in a pitiful way but some of his experiments actually revealed very remarkable results these results are still not out they are kept hidden in the united nations the thing is just because it is useful now should we use the results from the experiments which were done in violation of basic human rights we have to think the third example the example of alfred nobel which many of you might have known nobel is a swede was a swedish industrial chemist he was a very successful guy and um, he just wanted to blast rocks and bridges and so he played with uh, a chemical called nitroglycerin 
and later he mixed nitroglycerin with silica and then he saw that uh, they can be made into a paste and if they are made into a paste they can be rolled like uh, what you see in the picture and uh, you just have to light it with a thread or a wick and that's all it was a very very convenient uh, form called dynamite soon people started using it for negative things obviously humans have a tendency to do, do this all the time whatever nice things you give they will turn it into a negative thing so people started using dynamite as bombs instead of using it in the mines he made a uh, alfred nobel made a factory for making dynamite he patented it it may it uh, made him a lot of money he got very rich but still he felt very guilty because 90% of the dynamite was used for destructive purposes and not for what he intended not for mining so he left all his money in a will and said that from 1901 every year there will be nobel prizes given by the, with this money in the fields of uh, uh, medicine physics chemistry and so and uh, peace not economics the final example which we see is you know this famous equation e is equal to mc square this is a classic example of uh, this is a classic example of uh, how certain things which einstein did not intend became a huge part of the creation of the atomic bomb einstein had nothing to do with the bomb he did not work on this los alamos project he was not in the manhattan project but his equation was a very very defining factor of how energy is released from subatomic particles or especially during uh, radiative uh, radiative transfers and uh, he understood that the release of energy in these kind of subatomic particles can be after some time it will be uncontrollable it will go into a kind of uh, fission reaction and it will explode like a bomb he understood this principle very clearly so if someone uses it if someone uses uh, these kind of ideas in a negative way they will obviously make a bomb and germany was already trying to do this with his result but by this time einstein migrated to the united states and he wrote to president roosevelt he told see these are the things which quantum mechanics which was still new at the time is uh, proposing a lot of energy can be released by following fusion processes especially from things like uranium and polonium and we should be very careful in de dealing with these things otherwise it is going to create a huge atomic bomb and germany is already trying to do it so united states have to be faster and make a new bomb but you should not use it einstein was in a kind of uh, hassle because he did not know whether to use it or not he is a peace loving guy he did not want to use the bomb but he was very clear that if the germans made it first they will definitely use it so his suggestion was either to stop the germans from using it or you do it faster so that the germans get scared and this ethical issue was going on in his mind it is more of a moral dilemma for him moral dilemma or ethics we will see later and with this these are some of the famous examples in history where ethical issues played a real part it changed the world of course in a for better or not we don't know but it all these examples changed the world in a very drastic way so what should we do how do we approach experiments or studies also you can say first of all it's very simple ethical rules are not very uncommon ethical rules are not something which you have to think too much it is uh, if you follow your conscience it is very easy to execute ethical principles but at the same time the conscience also becomes tired at some point and that is the point where where the mind will offer you shortcuts the mind will say you don't have to do all this just do this it's fine 
and all these kind of thoughts will come this is when you become your mind, when you mentally become weaker but we can still make some amount of ground rules and we can actually follow it first of all we have to reject bad this is on a social scale for a personal scale we'll come later we have to reject bad experiments that will cause harm to other people you should never participate in these kind of experiments which is going to create a, lo a lot of trouble for humanity developing chemical warfare developing bio weapons all these kinds of things are unethical it may be interesting research even for example hacking it can be used for good as well as bad but usually people people use it only for bad things so you have to be very careful what kind of field what kind of research work you are going to choose whether it is going to cause harm to you or to other people both cases it's bad or we can say you can choose a field that will improve the state of science improve the state of fundamental science or the existing standard of industries or the existing standard of humanity at least a little bit for example studies like atomic physics sensors vaccines vaccines are a huge field and if you create a vaccine thousands and thousands even crores and crores of people are going to be benefited for example uh, and uh, there are a lot of vaccines which can be uh, developed even with simple ideas from a school student or a college student sensors a lot of examples of sensors are there even developed by school students for example if we have a sensor uh, which is sticking on a gas cylinder at home and whenever there is a gas leak the sensor is going to beep or change its color that is a very good and easy sensor to make that is going to benefit a lot of people atomic studies it is atomic studies are not going to uh, help common people but uh, it is improving fundamental science so that we understand nature a little bit more and nobody is affected so everything always goes through this filter called conscience conscience is an internal clock an internal alarm system that is indicate that indicates what is right and what is wrong for certain ethical principles you have to follow your schools or colleges or universities uh, rules and regulations but for the most part your mind deep down it will know whether it is true or not whether it is correct or incorrect whether it is evil or good good or bad all these things to a certain extent we know we just don't want to listen inside that is the truth as we get more and more knowledge as we gain more and more knowledge our ethical filters should automatically get more cleaner and it should get more refined unfortunately the opposite is happening the more knowledge a person has they are also prone more unethical issues that's what we see these days in scientific practice because everybody who publishes scientific work is a great scientist is have a, has a phd he has traveled a lot but still something is wrong somewhere so you have to gain knowledge in the right way with the correct ethical principles so for this you have to look at a thing very uh, unbiased without any ambiguity you should also share this knowledge this is very important because whenever there is whenever there is a kind of aberration whenever there is a kind of uh, uh, conflict in your mind maybe you think something is ethical but in principle it may not be ethical so when you share it someone can correct it as simple as that and secondly you should never claim someone's idea as your own this is this is the most important part of the whole lecture because this kind of uh, problems we see encounter these days as uh, reviewers in many journals so when i told about gaining knowledge gaining knowledge is not just about reading it was just about reading and hard work maybe some years back but now as i told you the world has become much more competitive the world has become much more competitive so you might have heard that smart work is also much more important than hard work so first of all a person has to be very organized and then he has to be productive productive in the sense you have if there are 100 ways to solve a problem you have to try all the 100 you have to keep on practicing 
and only then you have to reject things that does not work out and that if that is not satisfactory you have to find 100 another way 100 other ways and that is what is being productive because over time you will understand which things work and which things don't work so it will be easy for you to get smarter smart work does not come from the uh, from the first day it needs a lot of practice and it needs a lot of perseverance and hard work so first of all you have to be very honest that is always a given then you have to be organized you have to see which is the work that goes as top priority and then you have to be productive for example if i want to just go to the canteen and buy tea i don't uh, i can do it or i cannot do it it's not that much important but if you have to finish your homework or if you want to finish an experiment that always goes to the top uh, priority so being productive and being organized goes together and your list of what is the top priority what is low priority all these things have to be sorted out and then you have to start working really hard on that working really hard what does it mean sitting in the table for 10 hours no it's not that you have to put all your mental energy until you solve it until you completely understand a problem this this takes a lot of effort from your side and for this your health is, health should also be quite good if you are if if we don't have any kind of nutrition our body is not going to support you for a long term thinking uh, uh, thinking job if your job is to find solutions if you have to think hard get, uh, get knowledge in the hard way your body should also be very fit even though these things are not related directly related to ethics it, these are all indirectly related that's why i'm trying to explain because most of the audience here are just budding scientists in their initial years so even for example even for a chess player they used to say the body is the most important uh, part they have to spend a long time in the gym because their oxygen flow to the brain has to be very high if they have to play continuously some classical chess games for 8 hours or 10 hours so productivity means perseverance means that you have to put all your mental energy in understanding something never be satisfied with superficial understanding never be satisfied when you have solved <clears throat> when you have solved only 50% of the problem try to solve it 100% of the problem and then try to find another way and try to find another way so always have at least three or four ways to understand a problem deep work deep work is a very important concept it is uh, not just deep work is not just hard work i put this word on purpose because when we say deep work it denotes a certain kind of work which you can apply to any kind of field modern research in the past 4 years have done a lot of work on deep uh, work there is even a book called deep work what uh, these researchers claim is our attention span for the perseverance to work we need this deep work for our attention span to be at the same topic for a very long time is not possible so the maximum we can work is usually 4 hours continuously and you need a long break and then only you can do another 4 hour work so if you can work for 4 hours every day you can achieve more than what you are uh, if you work for 4 hours a day with at most concentration you can achieve more than what you do on a, on 8 or 10 hours with a weaker concentration so this 4 hour rule is something which you have to follow all through your life if you are planning to do some serious mind related work and the 4 hours is better done in the morning and then again you have to have your short and long term goals very clear so that you can execute your work without fail in scientific studies what happens is doing when you are doing research most of the time it won't work or every 99% of the experiment it will it will be a failure and everybody knows this who has worked uh, on some kind of experiments 
and uh, you have to the problem is you have to keep on doing again and again and again ah oh, so boring the problem is at some point your enthusiasm will go down so low that you don't want to continue at all but it is at this point your short and long term goals come into the picture then you have to remind yourself why are you actually doing it just for the money just for a job or are you really passionate about it if you do this you will not lose enthusiasm and then it will keep you going maybe you get tired physically and you can rest but you have to come back with more enthusiasm finally the two things which you have to remember you should always devote time to sit silently and think whatever you read or what whatever science concept you understand or whatever mathematical uh, problems you are working on you have to sit you have to spend some time and think what you learned is fair or not because whatever is written in the book may not be true you can have a better idea so you always believe that when you think more answers come to you and be ready to work very hard because there are no shortcuts in this way in this uh, field of science next i'll go to one another topic what we saw before was a little bit general now i'm going a little bit more specific so scientific investigation must be guided by what is right and what is wrong so how do we know what is right and what is wrong Uh, these things which uh, i already discussed before it depends on your conscience it depends on the moral standing you are it also depends on the rules of the institutions rules of the institutions have to be followed very clearly there is no compromise on that whichever country you live in whichever university you work in they have a specific set of rules and you should follow it and it, the start, that is the starting point of ethics and from there the investigations can be guided by what is right or what is wrong they help ensure that science is done safely and that scientific knowledge is reliable that is the reason every institution has some amount of rules if you copy from a paper if you are uh, plagiarizing if you are just reproducing from some other paper no school or college is going to allow that because everybody knows that that knowledge is not at all reliable first of all and it is not coming from your own individual analysis every research actually must be reported honestly this is where we are actually going wrong in many parts of india these days when we do scientific experiments it is not going to work immediately it takes a lot of time we need to be patient but in very small colleges since they are uh, very eager to publish a paper very eager to get recognition they don't report these uh, results very honestly and what in turn what they do is they just fabricate the data they change the data they modify the graph they change the numbers so that it is fitting it it comes out as a nice experiment maybe you can cheat someone this time but not always all the time so we have to be very careful in reporting maybe one paper you can publish by cheating maybe two three it's okay and nobody is going to come to your lab and check but what are we why are we actually doing this why are what is the point of doing science is it for just for publication no we want to be something we want to understand things a little bit better we want to call ourselves scientists because we want to take the present state of knowledge one step higher whatever it is we want to study hard and find something more deeper more truth in that that is why we are doing then if we don't report it we are just cheating uh, cheating our character for this we have to see things as they really are without bias what is actually bias bias is not just being greedy or publications or uh, having your name in a paper or something like this bias can come very from deep within the mind like a form of fear or insecurity also so we have to see whether the experimental results or let's say we don't even go have to go to experimental results if you are reading a novel and uh, the novel tells a kind of story 
it is a situation what exactly are they trying to say it is just what you read or is there something more so we have to try to see the situation in a deeper way for the, that's why i said we have to sit and think and uh, if we see this without any bias most of the things you will understand that it is easily more understandable than what you initially thought initially you may have thought that uh, this is not understandable but just sit for 5 minutes read again with a open mind without bias you see that it is not too difficult it is understandable if a person who wrote that novel was also a human being like you or me the person who made uh, uh, the theory of relativity einstein was also a human like you or me so if one person can do it with hard work another person can also do it provided you dedicate and spend the time there secondly you have to avoid errors errors are very common i'm not going too much into details of the types of errors <coughs> but basically there are two types of errors one is going to come from the experiment you do and the second one is going to come from the mind you have even if there are no experimental errors the mind can make some errors because maybe it doesn't understand it very correctly maybe instead of 2.2 by mistake you can write 22 so these kind of errors which is both inside and outside have to be treated very carefully that is why we always do the experiments or read scientific books more than one time to avoid errors in understanding as well as execution again i have put share knowledge here also there in the previous time it was gain knowledge and share knowledge here it was sharing knowledge here what i mean is sharing knowledge is very useful here to check the authenticity of your results whether there are any aberrations or errors which can be eliminated by honest discussion maybe with your teachers or students tests on humans and animals i already talked about it so no i am not spending time so the same concept i'm going a little bit deeper um am i on time yeah uh, we still have about 5 to 7 minutes yeah, yeah I, i can finish that sure mm, yeah then we actually go to the concept of avoiding mental conflict the most important thing is honesty here so the thing is well, our perception has to be very right a perception has to be very clear and for this our heart has to be quite pure i'm not talking in a spiritual way but i don't know how else to explain it when your heart is completely troubled at from home or if it is too if it has too much of fears inadequacy insecurity greed and all that it is not possible to see a scientific truth with an open mind einstein wrote a lot about it he told that great ideas come to one who is honest because by constantly thinking of truth and honesty einstein was able to keep a heart which was very 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 open and clear so that he could easily identify when a scientific truth was put into it or it flashes when we commit ourselves to honesty when we say that we are going to be promise ourselves that we are going to do these experiments honestly and with a lot of practice the conflict in the mind goes and along with that insecurity fear and all that so honest work is the best antidote for worry and fear the remaining concepts are just as it is being truthful and being silent these are some of the very important aspects of many of the great scientists which i have seen another thing is if you are not that good in any field it's okay nobody is actually good we just have to accept our limitation where we stand and then we have to work hard from that point we just have to see whether we are interested if we are interested in mathematics it's fine maybe now i am a very bad mathematician but if i start working from today eventually i am going to be a good mathematician but i have to be very sincere and truthful to show all these things in a child in a children's mind to remove these conflicts make their heart open without bias both school and parents have a lot to do with it so the honesty in scientific experiment is actually the honesty towards oneself and also towards others where you are uh, to the people you are dealing with 
conveying the principle of honesty to students and young scientists is the main principal uh, principal mission of the universities not only universities it is also coming from family so the amount of honesty you learn from family goes maybe 60 70% and the remaining things you learn at school and universities instead of uh, our school system is usually focused on teaching a lot of facts rather than how to handle your mind how to how to be honest and how to judge or how to judge uh, uh, a field of science without any bias or aberration why are we usually dishonest in the scientific world there is a lot of pressure we get funding and we have to prove and the time is running out so people try to make uh, uh, some fake results or uh, experiments which are not up to the standard they want to get ahead of their peers or sometimes it's just frustration so always when you are venturing into a field it is it is going to take time you make sure you follow all these ethical rules and be cool about it these are points which i already told the reasons for dishonesty are hung, being hungry for recognition being vain and greedy sometimes the rules are too much for them sometimes people are over ambitious but these are not excuses we should not use these excuses to get ahead in life we have to follow all the ethical rules which i told before and discover what is the negative pattern in our own mind and then eliminate it so as i told before there are a lot of there has been a lot of scientific misconduct there are few examples i am not going into detail but uh, there is a scientist there was a scientist yan hendrick shown he published almost one paper a week which is impossible for any scientist and uh, initially when they found the data was not good 16 of his articles were retracted his phd was cancelled even in iit dhanbad there were uh, two assistant professors who uh, who found out the committee found out that many of their papers had re repetitive data they did not cheat they used only repetitive data which is also amounting to scientific ethical breach so initially 14 of their papers were retracted and 25 more papers were retracted later on there are a lot of examples for this dietrich stapel for example uh, uh this uh, yoshiki sasai uh, for stem cell research in the in the university of freken and uh, fredem herman uh, he was a, a biologist then uh, the, uh, this uh, korean scientist about uh, uh, humans uh, cloning so these are all people they are all very big scientists very established scientists but still somehow they by chance they got into unethical means and now the career is completely spoiled so we have to be very careful what our ethical rules are and we stick to it misconduct like this in any form is going to be very bad for you personally and professionally more than professionally it will make you feel very bad personally because you will lose the confidence to go, do good research so you should always be good whether it takes time or not doesn't matter if you if you breach these ethical ethical guidelines eventually the guilt is going to going to make a big impact on you and your scientific credibility will be lost forever some good scientific practices and i'm in the last two slides i think sir uh some good scientific practices i'm not going to explain in detail the if you are doing higher research like a phd or something most of uh, these institutions uh, most of the institutions abroad i don't know about india but they have always a class and a chapter on how, what are the ethics that you have learned in the scientific community in that particular institution and uh, doctors have this hippocratic oath and all that and another important thing is you always have to keep a record of all the experiments or studies which you have done which can be lab books lab protocols excel sheets or even discussions and group meetings everything has to be documented so that you yourself don't forget and uh, do things in a different way being ethical also involves everything being documented and written even if you are retired or leave a university and if someone wants to access the data and redo the experiments it should not give a, it should not give a kind of a double result so uh, written 
note and confirmation of everything you do scientifically is a must whether you read it from the books or internet you always make a note and question the validity of these truths okay so this is the same good scientific practice a little bit more uh, elaboration so i skip this slide looking at scientific work is the same as what i told before we have to be very careful because when the mind always lies to you because it is not the mind is not usually a stable it is not a heart which beats at regular intervals it always gives excuses for things to make it easier the mind offers shortcuts when you are tired and very intense emotions also interfere with how you perceive scientific truth so you have to question your results and yourself at regular intervals before making a very thorough scientific statement so these are very general things so don't invent data yourself don't omit unwanted data but try to understand it don't use false methods don't take advantage of others don't manipulate data to achieve a desired outcome so the last topic i uh, we can talk a lot about it but i'm not going to talk much i just want to show this uh, uh, picture on plagiarism plagiarism is a huge topic it can be a lecture in itself uh, plagiarism is more or less very much accepted in some form which is very shocking in many places not directly but indirectly so very simple thing is if you are using others data it's plagiarism and it's not in good taste if you are also using your own data twice it's self plagiarism this also if if possible should be avoided this point i have to mention even though the time is uh, running out De deliberately making false interpretation of uh, experiments made by others we should not do this at all because it affects the credibility of other people's uh, other people's work they some people may have worked on it for many years and just because you want to get ahead you should not just make others look bad this is a, a principal uh, part of ethics and if someone else also does an ethically wrong thing it is best you take the initiative to report it just because they are your friends or something like this you should not just uh, keep your keep your mind or uh, mouth shut so these are two things the education system also plays a very uh, huge role uh, there is a, there is going to be a change in our system soon instead of uh, 10th plus 2 we have a 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 and uh, the way this actually is going to change how we actually perceive knowledge and uh, how we perceive knowledge is also going to have uh, an important aspect on our ethical learning and character building so before previously like 40 or 50 years back teachers used to take a lot of authority they used to threaten students they used to uh, make the life of a student really suffer things are changing to a great deal even if someone these days even if a student has some kind of uh, differential uh, disability in learning teachers are able to understand that if they have an autism or something like this things are progressing much more so the importance of education on ethics it is a very young field as of now so we will have to wait and see how this turns out but hopefully for the better so there are only few points actually which i wanted to make all the story is only about these four points you usually if you want to do research choose a topic that interests you simple work very hard on the topic and be very honest about it a lot some time to think about it so that you may come to your own conclusion and always be vigilant to eliminate unethical issues unethical practices so that brings me to the end of my lecture thank you very much for listening if there are any questions just let me know thank you thank you very much dr vijayaraghavan for can i press this uh, chat box to see yeah 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 maybe maybe if you can just stop sharing for a while and you can see the chat there are several questions by the students and yeah, i questions. hope yeah are you able to see those questions yeah yeah i am able to see there is a chat box open yeah questions 
Oh, it come it came here. There, there are quite a lot. I don't know how I can answer. Uh, all I, I think whichever one you would like to pick up, uh, it's absolutely up to you. Or you would like to club two, three, and then would like to answer them. Okay, let's uh, choose just uh, this one initially. Uh, Abhi Jain says, uh, Sir, I'm currently in 10th standard. Please tell me what should I do in the future as I want to become an engineer or an architect. So, obviously, he has to finish 12th standard successfully. And uh, by this time, he will already have an idea and probably not uh, need my advice at this point because uh, he's still in 10th standard. Why Alfred Nobel was not considered uh, as a Nobel Prize winner in economics? Is economics not as much important like uh, literature or mathematics? That's a very good question. Actually, Alfred Nobel himself was the one who invented the Nobel Prize out of his own money. And he made it very clear in the will, he did not want to have any Nobel Prizes. He wanted uh, the prizes were uh, given only for uh, physics, chemistry, physiology, or medicine. Uh, what is the other topics? Literature. And only then later economics and peace came. So Alfred Nobel initially was concerned only about literature, physics, chemistry, and medicine. So the uh, peace, uh, peace and economics came later. And he did not, he wrote it very clearly in the will that he did not want to be a part of it. Can we, this is also a good question. Prera asked, can we blame the scientists for the destructive impacts of their theories? Hmm. More than actually, a scientist has obviously a responsibility. However, if the government is forcing the scientists to do something, the scientist's power is becoming less. Just even if, uh, the prime minister comes and asks me to do something. I have to do it because he's the leader of the country. I cannot say no. So most of these scientists who did bad things, they did not do it just for the fun of destroying. They had a lot of background to it. And uh, there was war going on at the time. There was a famine. There was a medical disaster. And uh, there was governmental pressure. So if we want to blame anyone, it is probably the government at that point not the scientists. The scientist still has, but the scientist is a very, these uh, scientist examples which I gave, they are very genius people. So they had the talent and if they didn't do it, who will do it? Someone has to make that science. And if uh, Fleming did not do, uh, did not come up with penicillin, for example, or if Einstein did not do relativity, maybe someone would do, but not immediately. It will take another 30, 40 years for another scientist to come up with that theory. So, uh, just being a genius is not their fault. They are, they are like this and uh, it is up to the society to make good use of it. That's a good question. Uh, Anish asked, Sir, now most of the students are either distracted or addicted to social media. Why do students tend to go for a greater dopamine rush? Actually, being distracted and being addicted to social media are actually the same thing. Because if you see like 25, 30 years back when we did not have cell phones, our distraction was also less and our sense of addiction was also less. Uh, there is a scientist called uh, Walter Scholz and he described exactly this phenomenon. He says that uh, the more you are distracted, the more your addictive behavior also increases. Or the more your addiction increases, the more your distractedness also increases. So both of these things are the same thing. And both of these things initially give a dopamine rush only as long as the brain is capable of uh, producing it. After some time, what happens is the body loses the ability to create the same kind of rush which, uh, uh, same, uh, which uh, it used to do. That's why most of the addicts either social media or any drug, they cannot stop at some point 
because they want more dopamine and so they have to take more and more drugs so it, this is a very bad circle it goes on and on it never stops so unless we make rules for ourselves which is going to be very painful initially if you want to stop watching internet for the first 3 uh, 4 days it's going to be very uh, painful but maybe after a week you will slowly start to see life in a more good way in a more uh, beautiful way and uh, things that were not noticeable before now you will start to notice the small and the nice things so it is up to us to take the responsibility to stay away from social media and internet for a long time being connected all the time is obviously going to make you more and more addicted in the future sir why youth are not de much developing much into developing country i don't know what exactly uh, uh, the question is the last one from ms so uh, whether is he asking whether you the I youth are not going i think he is more referring to uh, why the youth of the country they are not contributing much for the development of the country I mean, or they what, are not much into developing countries or yeah, something, something like, like that perhaps the question is a bit ambiguous but whatever we could make out yeah i'll just take it as why youth are not developing much in our country yeah it is exactly the same because a lack of clear goals and ethical values and then a lot of distraction from social media so actually i that in this one of the point i put this word deep work there is a book called deep work and uh, i would suggest people to uh, buy it and read it there they give a practical suggestions to be completely out of social media being connected at least for uh, half a day where you will do productive work like reading or cleaning your house or something like this uh, not contributing see contribution cannot come just in one step contribution um, means like if i am if i am asking him to if i am asking a you to come to my office and clean it he will clean it and go and according to him he contributed something but uh, to be contributing on a national scale uh, to be contributing on a national scale it requires more than just uh, working hard one has to have a very clear vision and uh, love for truth and uh, to be clear of distractions i can't say much on that without uh, going into too much details now perhaps you can take up the last question and before we there are many scientists that. who did the serendipity serendipity is something which happens without our control so they did not do serendipity when something happens we call it serendipity so that is not unethical at all unethical would uh, drawing inspiration from nature is perfectly okay as long as people don't uh, do the same work twice if i also publish a theory of gravitation because an apple falls on my head that would be unethical but uh, what happens what happened to newton was just serendipity which means actually it's a coincidence and uh, if uh, we read newton's principia mathematica it is not as simple as apple falling on his head it was it's a very detailed uh, mathematical work so it has a lot of serendipity is just a starting point of inspiration after that we have to work very hard also i think you have taken up nearly all possible questions and we are also very near to one hour time slot which we have allocated for this so thank you very much uh, dr vijay rakhwan for spending your valuable time and sharing your experiences and giving a whole new dimension to ethics in science education and especially in practice also and i hope that this talk must have been very much motivational to all the attendees and they would adhere to some of the advices which we have given uh, during your talk and the suggestions and perhaps the school teachers and the principals who are there in the uh, audience will definitely take up this maybe as a short term program to apprise all possible students in the school itself 
so that when they join a higher education or research program, they will follow all these things in practice also. So on behalf of the National Academy of Science India Delhi chapter and the India Lupathya College, I would like to thank you once again. And I also would like to thank all the attendees for being there with us today and hope to see you all tomorrow for another interesting lecture. Uh, I'll be sharing the details with all of you via email. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. For all. Thank you, sir, very much sure. for inviting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.